We're back now with our politics panel. Susan Page is Washington Bureau Chief at USA Today. Rehan Salam is the executive editor of the National Review. Ruth Marcus is a columnist at the Washington Post. And Jonathan Martin is national political correspondent for the New York Times. Susan, I want to start with you. Where is the Republican race now as you see it? You know, John Kasich told you in your interview that there had been 10 contested conventions and that only three of them went with the front runner. But there's been one contested convention since we went to the modern primary system, and it went with the front runner going into the convention. That was Gerald Ford in 1976. Like it or not, Donald Trump is likely to be the Republican nominee for president, and that can be a really messy convention or can be a relatively smooth convention. But the fact is, he is by far the most likely nominee going at this moment. But we're not going to know until California, probably, which is the last day of voting, June 7th, when California and New Jersey, two large states, will cast their ballots. And California is district by district, which means that with the possibility of the GOP race, John, coming down to a Ted Cruz, John Casey, Donald Trump battle at the heartland of Santa Monica, Marin County, <laughs> real red America, yeah. could right. decide who the next GOP nominee is. Right. Rayon, what, if you are... Uh, if you are not certain about Donald Trump or you're actively trying to work against him, where does the smart a activity go? Do you get behind Kasich? Do you ask Kasich to drop out? What's your... S Look, Kasich has a lot of decent qualities. He is someone who would fare well in a general election. He's from the Midwest. He's from a big swing state. It's also true that it is impossible for him to win. And the idea that he is going to be the one coming out of a broker convention is just, it just defies comprehension. Uh, you know, it speaks to a level of self-delusion that, I mean, if there have been a lot of delusional candidates in this race, Ted Cruz is very flawed, but what is also true is that he has a very strong, consistent position on immigration. One can imagine some of the voters that Donald Trump has energized going behind, going along with Ted Cruz. It is very hard to imagine many other Republicans pulling that off. And the other difficulty is that conservatives have to move on a parallel track, which is thinking hard about a minor party race as well. And doing both of those things at once, yeah. trying to deny Trump the nomination while also trying to organize outside of the party, if necessary to give conservatives a place to vote, is going to be really challenging. So you mean a third party yes. creation. Uh, Ruth, uh, Donald Trump is meeting with some Washington Republicans this week. He's talking about phone calls with Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and unity. Uh, what about those Republicans who are getting to yes with Donald Trump? Well, there are some Republicans getting to yes with Donald Trump, but there are a lot of Republicans getting to OMG with Donald Trump. And I think we need to sort of pause and um, appreciate the pigs flying moment that we're in right now. <laughs> to have Lindsey Graham um, to, uh, endorsing Ted Cruz. Um, because of on, all the things he said that have not all, been yeah, complimentary. To have Senator the Cruz. Republican establishment, which Ted Cruz has spent um, his entire time in Washington and before kicking in the teeth, um, now trying to coalesce around Ted Cruz is pretty remarkable. The, the Trump outreach to the establishment is interesting, but what we see with Trump is there's kind of one part outreach and then two steps of, oh, there'll be riots and, uh, you know, just behavior and comments that are just not acceptable to the Republican establishment. I, one really quick thing, I find the third party piece, and I know you guys wrote about yeah. it. Um, very far-fetched. The ballot access rules make it very difficult to mount but a let me serious third-party challenge. Add one fast point there. It is very difficult to get somebody on the ballot to run as an independent, which is why what they're looking at doing is basically piggybacking on one of the, the, the minor parties, libertarians, constitution, that already have ballot access. And, and doing that, it makes it a little bit easier. It's still certainly a long ball, perhaps even a Hail Mary, but if you do it with a, a party that already exists, it's a little bit easier. Would the parties that already exist allow well, themselves and, to be the host and that's of the a other, Republican party? That's the other challenge, too, is you have to, you have to convince them that that's what you're doing. But this is- And the sort to of, what end? What's to, the goal? To stop Trump from winning stop, the presidency. And then what happens? Well, well you deny him the presidency, also, there are, it's about a and possibly to a throw it to the House. Republican. About a fifth to a quarter of Republicans who will not vote right. for Donald Trump, who are simply not going to turn out for him. When you think about down ballot races, when you think about the party apparatus going forward, right. it is not obvious that this third party bid would not actually be a vessel for the party that's yes. to come. Because another thing, you know, that Frank pointed out earlier is that if you look at young people, 18 to 29 voters, they choose Bernie Sanders by a wide margin of yeah. the Republican field. The Republican Party needs to think around the bend. Donald Trump has yeah. <laughs> he's energized a lot of voters who are frankly not going to be the voters you know, of the future. You know, this discussion, though, underscores 
underscores why the Stop Trump movement has gone nowhere. There's not a candidate that's acceptable. Yeah. There's not a strategy that works. The Republicans I've talked to off the record, Republican officials here in town, think they're going to lose in November. And the strategy, is there a way to lose the presidency but hold the Senate? Is there a way right. to lose the White House and the Senate but not have the party destroyed? And that is a discussion going on. And they are not of one mind of whether Ted Cruz or Donald Trump is the smarter bet yes. if what you're thinking about is post-2016. This is, well, you know, it, the I asked Senator of, yeah. Graham this question, the gap between what they say privately and what they're willing to do public, and the gap is vast. Yes, but there is a way to stop Donald Trump. The problem is that they are divided between two candidates trying to stop him, and it's a very familiar divide. It's the pre-Trump divide. It's almost quaint now, <laughs> establishment and conservative, and they can't figure out who should stop him, and it's hard for these folks in the party to get behind Ted Cruz. Mitt Romney and Lindsey Graham are trying to make it easier, but it's, it's still very difficult. Neither but one of them would is, say the word endorse when is, they yeah. talked about Ted the Cruz. The state of the GOP in March of 2016 is, we have to lose with Cruz, it's important. I mean, that's <laughs> astonishing, right? That they are trying to save their party by nominating somebody that and, they assume will lose the presidency. Yeah, and at the same time, I think that the notion, I, I, I kind of disagree with Frank that uh, Donald Trump would be a less strong candidate against Hillary Clinton and Ted Cruz. I think that the um, Clinton campaign is quite nervous about the prospect of running against Donald because Trump. Because why? Because who the knows? The unknown, Be you know. Because the Rust Belt, because all those um, downscale white guys, uh, who knows what, um, you know with Ted Cruz, sort of where he's going and what he's going to say. You don't know that with Donald Trump and you don't know what voters he can enter. I was shocked to see Lindsey Graham, by the way, willing to die on the hill of Gang of Eight style comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, so, you know, to his credit, he is willing to get behind someone like Ted Cruz. But it is incredible to see that a position that is rejected by a large majority of Republicans, he is still willing to die on that hill. And again, it's not just about illegal immigration. It's also larger concerns about what is the right immigration strategy for the future of this country. And that is something that, you know, if if the whole effort to stop Trump becomes associated with what you might call Grahamism or Ryanism, that's going to be a problem and that's an opportunity for Ted Cruz. Well, that's right. You're pointing out the contradiction here between I mean, here you have somebody who believes in comprehensive immigration reform, which Ted Cruz adamantly does not, nevertheless being a person who's saying Ted Cruz should be the nominee. Yeah, that's, and it's a mixed message. Pigs, yeah, pigs are still in the air here. Susan, More to come. Susan, <laughs> yeah, right. There's logic right now. Susan, yeah. let me ask you this question. Donald Trump said there would be riots if he was, if the nomination were taken from him, and that was seen as a way to, as a kind of incendiary thing. But isn't he right? Both, both things are right. It's an incendiary thing to say, not something we've heard our political leaders say before, and he is right. Uh, I mean, if, if Donald Trump goes to the convention just shy of 1237, but having won the most states, having won by far the most delegates, by getting the most votes, do you think that they're going to go away quietly saying, oh, well, okay, we, a Cruz Kasich ticket, that makes a lot of sense for the GOP? No, there's going to be trouble. And I think one of the most... Um, disheartening things that we've seen is a continuing and escalating violence at Trump rallies by protesters and by the Trump forces against the protesters. And and I, I think Donald Trump should think twice about continuing to fuel that particular fire. Ruth, let me, switching to the Democrats, ask you this question. If people blocked the road to an Obama event in 2008, what would the Democratic reaction have been to that, <laughs> the way they blocked a, the road to the Trump event? Uh, I think you know the answer to your question, and I'm not. And I'd like to say that which I, is what? Sorry, in which, case which, people which at is, home don't. Which is, um, pe people would outraged. Democrats would have been outraged at the notion of people blocking uh, access to Obama events. And I think that actually there is a role for protest, but there also needs to be space. And we've talked about it before um, with respect to the Black Lives Matter movement and stopping Sanders from speaking. There has to be space for Trump to relay his message as odious as it is and there is appropriate space and time for protesters to disagree with that message without squelching it entirely. Jonathan, what's the role for Bernie Sanders going forward now on the Democratic side? Getting a lot of media attention, pushing his message, winning delegates where he can, and trying to basically go into the convention with uh, uh, the ability to leverage the party towards a more populist orientation and sort of keeping the pressure on her uh, ideologically uh, more than he is in an actual threat to win the race. Susan, the math is very difficult. 
I was struck when, when Senator Sanders said, well, she may have gotten two million more votes, but they're mostly in the South. Isn't the argument of his campaign that he has such a message that will break through and that that's why he would do well as a president? Because even in precincts that have a Revolution turns yeah. out to be hard, be, yeah. but <laughs> more successful than any of us would have predicted yeah. six okay. months ago, to be, to be clear. I think you're right. The math is hard. It's hard to see how he gets the nomination. But you know what? Hillary Clinton needs Bernie Sanders on her side. Once he yeah. finally gets out of the race after the convention, she needs Bernie Sanders to make her case with energizing, especially younger voters, right. because he continues to crush her in that demographic. And she needs him not only to support her, but to care enough about her candidacy to come out and vote in November. And watch for Bernie Sanders in the next bit to sharpen his message against Donald Trump and not as much against Hillary Clinton, because he's kind of looking down the road as La well. Last question to you, Rayhan. How much can the Democrats use what's happening in the Republican race right now in the general election against whoever the nominee oh, is? Oh, they can absolutely use it, particularly Hillary Clinton, to great effect. The trouble is that when you have a tremendous success, when you have a kind of catastrophic success, like Hillary Clinton might have in a race against Donald Trump, then the Democratic coalition becomes so big, so broad, so expansive, that you start having more civil wars within that mm -hmm. coalition. And the Bernie Sanders challenge represents the future. This party that now seems unified against Trump is going to have a lot of fractiousness as it has in previous eras, and that's going to become uh, something that's going to be very, very interesting. You kind of prefer to be the Democrats right now. <laughs> Oh sure, but it's not a but but it's a, it's an unsettled uh, yes, seat sides. at the moment. All right, we're going to have to end it there. We'll be back in a moment with a look at the fight over President Obama's Supreme Court nominee.